One of the uh, greatest pleasures I've had as editor of The New Individualist is the uh, opportunity to showcase people uh, who many people don't know or don't know well. And um, Michael Newberry is fairly well known within our circles, but uh, the extent of his understanding of art and what he has brought to the publication in terms of uh, introducing us to noted uh, contemporary figures in art have really elevated the magazine, in my opinion. And um, uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm just uh, thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to uh, uh, moderate this session and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, 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 the history of art and the meaning of art. In this case, uh, Michael's subject is going to be uh, the nude in art as an expression of individualism, of, of individualist values. And uh, it, it, just on its face, the subject matter sounds, uh, sounds pr so provocative that I'm just interested in what he's going to say. He's the art critic, as I said, of the new individualist. Uh, he lives in Brooklyn. He makes a, a living as a full-time artist. Uh, he, uh, his drawings, oil sketches, the large canvases he does, uh, I would imagine that more than a few people uh, at this conference may have uh, uh, some of his works. Uh, they convey a freshness and originality and a drama of composi uh, composition. Uh, I, I think that uh, what, they, what he brings about and what he draws from art history in his work is uh, truly remarkable. So not only does, is he knowledgeable about the history of art, you have somebody who uh, uh, walks the walk, as they say. He has recently established the Foundation for the Advancement of Art, whose mission is to recognize and promote innovative, contemporary, representational painters and sculptors of the kind that he introduces to us each month in The New Individualist. I'm pleased uh, to be and honored to be able to introduce Michael Newberry. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I want to make one correction. You, you introduced the uh, Foundation for the Advancement of Art. In 2003, we had a conference in Manhattan at the Pierre Hotel, and it's documented on DVDs. Uh, David Kelly spoke at it and uh, Stephen Hicks, and it was a, a really fantastic thing. But I couldn't do both. I couldn't be a painter and maintain the foundation, so it's, uh, it's finished. Um, the nude in art has graced um, civilizations of ancient Greece, the Italian Renaissance, many countries in Europe, a little bit in, in the United States. And the beautiful and the heroic nude is an important ingredient for, the, for a flourishing culture of individualism and for innovation. And in my talk, I'm going to sh show you some of those connections. Um, what I'm going to start with is a contrast between some clothed figures, so you get an idea of how I'm looking at it, and then with some nudes. And one kind of a qualification I want to make for all you realists out there is that in real life, right now we have the temperature of this room, we have air, we have sound, we have movement, we have time, we have all these ingredients going on. But a painter or a sculptor only has one or two senses to work with. So we manipulate those senses to communicate. So we can't just be literally true. So you might say, well, people really look like that, but for a painter, that's not enough to communicate. We want to stylize it and, and tweak it because we only have the one sense to work with. Um, and I consider that that art is a conceptual medium, not a literal one. OK, so we're going to start with. Um, uh, Ramesses. Um, he was born in uh, 1300 BC. And we're going to talk about the status of closed figures. So his body, his hands, his knees are, are pretty simple. They're straightforward. There's not a lot of movement. There's, it, it's, it's, it's just straight on. But what is conveying is his headdress. It's a type of crown. That's a really important element. That's the most important element of the work. And um, here, the form of the cobra is this thing at the top here, around here. That is um, symbolic 
that it's the radiance, it's coming from the sun god's eye, and it can, it can dissipate people. It can burn them. And so that's the, they're using symbolism to say he is a powerful force. They're not worried about his, his, his personality, who Ramesses really is. Now, the crown, pretty much across the board, has been traditionally it represents power, legitimacy, immortality, righteousness, victory, triumph, resurrection, honor, glory. It comes with all these symbols. And also the scepter here also has uh, its meaning of authority. There's the globe with the cross. That means the, the connection with Christianity and uh, uh, in control of the universe. Now, if you look at her figure, her dress looks like it's made out of cardboard. She is stiff as it comes. She's straight on, a little bit like the Egyptian sculpture. Her head is egg-shaped. There's very little expression going on. And this is, this is a copy that was based on a prototype that Elizabeth wanted to have. So she wasn't interested in people knowing about who she really was. She was interested in saying, I am the Queen of England. So these are all these things to send that message to the people. So it's, the symbolism of it is actually a kind of barrier between us and the person. So they're using the clothes and the trappings to send a message to us. Here's an Ung painting, and I won't even begin to tell you the title. It's all in French, and uh, it's, uh, she's a princess with a big, 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 um, uh, uh, lots of names there. Um, she's wearing a beautiful silk dress. Um, there's obviously a lot of wealth here. The pearls around her wrist. Um, she's a gold bracelet, uh, a gold necklace. Um, this soft material that has the brocade, the gold brocade, um, the chair, and there's up in the upper right-hand corner is a, a logo of um, arms. Um, and she, I have kind of sympathy for who she is when I look at her face. She's a bit, I, I feel she's a little bit trapped in all of this stuff. Um, she looks a little sad. She looks um, that, you know, okay, I'm doing, I'm here for a portrait. It's my duty to be here. But she's not very expressive at all about who she is. But all the clothes are telling us everything about her, her wealth and the quality of her lifestyle and all this stuff, but not her. Now we switch gears. Uh, to this Malay, and the same thing actually applies. Here we have, well, it helps having the title, because I originally thought they were coming home from work, so I could understand why they were grubby and tired, and, and you know, really, you know, when you've really worked in the fields, you're, or I haven't worked in the fields, but after a long day of tennis, <laughs> but, but, um, but they're starting their day. They're going off to work, and they're starting off dirty and miserable, and it, it's horrific. But the clothes are telling us this. There's not much we don't see. We see a little bit of her facial expression, but it's mostly the clothes. Now, I thought what's funny is that she's wearing a crown of sorts, a work basket, and he's got a scepter of sorts as the pitchfork. And so it's sending, just like the, the royalty things, it's sending us, these are real workers. And these people don't have a chance ever to change. So what the clothes are telling us is the class and the time of the people. So uh, we know they're not Americans from the 1980s or from 2000. Um, they're um, not, uh, they don't look like ancient Greeks. So, what the clothes do is they tell you the time and the status of, of the person.
the famous Whistler's mother. Um, here we have a very conservative painting. Again, uh, she's wearing a black dress. My guess is Puritan, but I don't have all the details about it. But the, the white lace headdress. But her expression on her face is, I think she's really vacant. She, she looks like someone who's just worked hard, done all the right things in her life. She's got her feet up on a little stool, so it makes her a little bit more comfortable old in age. But everything is, again, rigid and formal. She's in profile. She's just like the Egyptian sculptures. So we don't see much about who she is other than the room that she lives in, the clothes that she's wearing. Christina's World, um, a famous Andrew Wyeth painting. Uh, again, I mean, it helps having the date here, but I remember my grandmother wearing a house smock that was just like that. It was very simple. It's just to work around the house. Um, and we don't, uh, do you guys know, do you, do you know about this painting that she was a cripple and that she had to crawl that way to her home? Well, that tells us everything about the painting, but we don't know that just look, by looking at the painting. It helps us if we have the story. So what we just see is a woman in a field and we don't have a clue of what she's doing there. And she's even wearing socks which I, I thought was interesting. So we see someone who's, it, it's a, it's, she's in, a, in, a, in a, a farmland. She's wearing a very simple dress. We don't know the expression on her face. We don't really know much about her. And this is a Philip Perlstein painting. It's a, undoubtedly a commissioned portrait of the Pillsbury's. And um, here again, they're, they're dressed. There's no real interaction between them. They're a married couple. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's, and the space, the, the, the bureau behind them makes it a little claustrophobic, so they feel a little trapped in the space. And the, the one outstanding feature, I thought, was her diamond ring seems to be the most prominent. It's almost dead center in the painting, and we can really see it. So that's like what it's worth. It's the diamond ring. That's, <laughs> to me, what the painting is about. And if you look at their facial expressions, um, uh, again, they have something of a trapped quality. Uh, I don't know how to say the word pendulant, pendulant, Pe petulant. The guy's face, look at his mouth. He's not happy. He doesn't want to be there. Um, again, the clothes tell us about their time period. Um, the diamond ring tells us a little bit about their status. Uh, and. To me, it's again following the same thing. The clothes are telling you who, who, who these people are, where they live, what their environment is like. But we don't really know a lot about them other than that little in the facial expression. One of the most famous contemporary painters right now is Rick Richter. And he's funny. He, he does photorealism and abstract expressionism <laughs> equally. He just jumps from one to the other. Um, this, uh, this painting is photorealistic. We know that it's some kind of uh, synthetic clothes of some sort, maybe a combination. Um, she's turning away. We don't know really anything about her um, that way. What, what Richter might have been doing, which is a little, little observation, is that her pose might be the same as the Christina, except the head is, both heads are turned away, but the shoulders and the arms and the hip are about identical. And Richter probably, he might have known that. So he might have played off of that. So this tells you um, that clothes, artists use clothes to use symbols to tell us about the people. They're not really using the people to tell us about the people.
So now, individuality expressed by the nude. Um, now there's, I'm going to introduce you to this. There's, there's two things going on with the nude. One is that it's universal. This becomes a woman. We don't know about her. We don't know if she was a barmaid or rich or an heiress of some sort or a princess or a prostitute. We don't really know. Any, their clothes are not telling us anything. All we see is this vital, happy, uh, playful uh, woman. And so doing a nude makes a work universal. But simultaneously, it tells us about who that person is by her body language. If you notice the expression on her face, she's, she's got a half smile going on. Her hands are absolutely beautiful. And the hand that's up in the air playing with the parrot is gorgeous. And the torque in her body creates a lot of movement. So we get a very interesting dynamic, universal and individual. Now, I couldn't resist this. this I, I'm, I'm shooting the gun a little here. But I started early um, on this. Uh, the painting was, this is by Courbet. And this is a quote of his. I'm 50 years old, and I've always lived in freedom. Let me end my life free. When I am dead, let this be said of me. He belonged to no school, to no church, to no institution, to no academy least of all to any regime except the regime of liberty. Now, you all may not make the connection between that painting and that statement, but I do. And that's what I wanted to start showing you today, is these connections that this artist, that's what he means. But it's a little hard to translate the painting into that exact quote, but it's a magnificent quote about freedom. Um, here we have a Northern Renaissance painting, a uh, door, Adam and Eve, 1507. And it's, uh, the Northern Renaissance is a little bit more awkward than the Italian Renaissance. In the Italian Renaissance, I'll show you a couple of pictures later. They had a more naturalistic, fluid look. But even, even here, if you can see his facial expression and her facial expression, there's, a, there's longing, there's love, there's innocence. There's um, a lot uh, going on there. She almost looks like she's walking on air. If you notice that, she's walking on air. And if you can recall the Elizabeth first, that their expressions are much more vital. They're really coming out showing who they are as, as people. And the Elizabeth the first was behind a veil, reserved. And this is a Bellini. He was one of, um, uh, he was the mentor for uh, uh, the famous uh, painter Titian. And compare this painting with the Pearlstein painting of the, of the Pillsbury's. There's a, she, the, the molding in her body is much more done with more affection, more love, more care. Um, it's not bumpy. They had bumpy uh, facial features and everything. There's a lot of fluidness going on. And there's also an element of, and I'll, I'll be bringing this up again and again, but an unselfconsciousness. We have nudes that they're just there. They're free. And I believe that that indicates uh, self-esteem of the person. They're just free to be who they are. They don't need any trappings to hide behind. And this Boucher, a uh, detail of uh, Diana bathing. Um, and in this one, he has, uh, Boucher paints a lot of nymph-like um, uh, women. Uh, he was uh, commissioned by Madame Pompidou. Uh, but if you notice, notice her left arm and how she's got a bicep. She's toned. <laughs> she, actually, she actually looks like some of the female tennis players at Wimbledon right now with a very young, toned body and a very uh, innocent face. 
And she's also got her legs crossed in an interesting way, which is kind of a masculine trait, a slightly masculine touch. So he's used his technique of doing these very nymph-like people, but he's made her a little bit masculine. Give, and, Di and, and Diana is Artemis, the huntress, the, the legend of the huntress who hunted people and deers and all kinds of people when she was pissed off at them. Um, and uh, so there's a, he's, he's using her body to express a lot about who this Diana is. And uh, the famous Olympia of Manet. Um, and here, he, uh, he used a, a, a prototype of a classical Venus, and then he changed it by having a contemporary Parisian. Uh, you notice her body t uh, type is, is, is not as uh, Rubenesque. It's not uh, large and round. She's, she's toned. She's slender. She's petite. Um, we do have a little indication of her uh, um, collar, the um, choker. Um, and, uh, but she is sitting there with a lot of confidence. Now, this painting created a huge outrage in, in Paris because she was, a, she was a, I think the model for it was a, was a prostitute. And that it was so contemporary that people wanted to stay safely within the classical tradition. And he just made it contemporary by putting a, a, a woman that they may come across in real life or see. And uh, here's a Renoir. It's one of my favorite Renoirs. Um, we have uh, another self-conscious, uh, unself-conscious uh, woman. She looks a little bit sad. But the light and the voluptuousness of her body um, is, is very fully developed. And if you notice, the background is abstracted, so we have no concentration on the background. It's, it's all about her and her torso. So Renoir was driving home um, who this, the woman's presence and her body and her type of ideal as being a full-bodied, not uh, athletic, but very um, rounded and soft and voluptuous. And again, we don't know. She does have a gold bracelet, but we don't know what class she comes from. So again, we get the same thing. It's a universal woman. And yet we're seeing enough details. We see the shape of her breasts and the quality of her arms, the type of hair she has, to, to see that it's an individual. Um, again, coming back to the theme of in, in real life, I think all of us here, we, we all strive for balance in our lives, to put some security of money in the bank, to have love, to have good relationships with our families, with friends, um, to do something interesting in life. And again, a sculptor or a painter can't show you all those things. They just can't show you all those things. So what they do is they show you balance and putting all these things together by knowing anatomy. That's knowledge. So that's like, well, that's not the money in the bank. The money in the bank, the security is giving it the weight where it feels natural. And then the proportions, the balance of proportions is the same thing as putting together different ingredients. So we get proportions. We get the expression, uh, the, the flow of the movement the energy. And that is a way an artist is telling you that this is a whole person. It's not that you have to look like the person, but you can relate to them by putting your life together. So that's a symbol of a life put together, not just a person. Um, first, the first artist to sign works um, were the Greeks. Now, this one's very, very interesting also is that the artist this is called the canon. And the artist wrote a treatise about proportions. He wrote, we don't have it, but we've had it documented. He wrote about how he used the baby finger. 
If you notice the baby finger of the guy, he used the baby figure as the measurement to do every single element of proportion throughout the figure, like the distance between the eyes going down, the size of the mouth, working the whole way through. It, it looks to us as very, very natural. And I've had an argument with Marsha Enright once, but it is a nightmare to do. It is so difficult to put a figure in proportion. It is really, really challenging and difficult. And when you get it right, it just looks natural as if it was the easiest thing in the world. And this is an Aphrodite or a Venus. And again, prax, uh, Praxiteles. Um, this comes about uh, 100 years uh, later, but it's the first female heroic nude. And it was um, praised, and this is a Roman copy, but it was praised uh, throughout the ancient world as being the most beautiful sculpture that ever existed. Um, and again, it's the proportions coming through, uh, the, 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 the subtlety. It's not terribly sexual, but yet she's, she's all there. Um, and, uh, and again, it's a copy, so we don't really get to see what it was really like. The, the, the copies can uh, be somewhat um, cruder. Now, also in ancient Greece, um, they made a very interesting thing, and this comes into objectivism. They made no distinction between their athletes or warriors or beautiful women and the gods. This is not a sculpture of a god. This is a sculpture of an athlete. And this is a sculpture of a god. So there's no difference. So what they're actually saying in, in ancient Greece is that humans are godlike. At our best, when we are being our best, that is what is godlike. And uh, that's a, we all, I'm going to come up with this, um, uh, deal with this a little bit later. This is a famous David, high renaissance, Michelangelo. Uh, how many people have seen this? It's, 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 OK, so it's, it's, it's an amazing piece. Now, one of the, one of the th hypotheses that I have is that the nude inspires others in different fields to be the best they can be, to inspire their imagination, to go after their dreams. Now, there's um, a scholar, Joseph Dobbin, professor, uh, professor of history and the history of science at uh, Lehman College, uh, City University of New York. And he has presented a theory about Galileo. And Galileo, and this is quoting, Galileo uh, achieved in a revolution, revolutionizing physics was to show how observation, careful measurement, and attention to structure of a given event all led to an appreciation of hidden causes that ultimately express pers persuasive mathematical unity of all nature. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I'm, so I'm taking this from him. And he goes on, but Galileo was not the first to have done this. Although in terms of astronomy and physics, he was clearly a pioneer, the Renaissance artists, painters, sculptors, and architects had been observing nature with a special interest in depicting it faithfully, realistically, from the early 15th century on. By turning to the problem of art and science in the Renaissance, it is possible to find what I believe are important roots for Galileo's own particular realistic and idealistic approach to nature. So he's making the connection that the Renaissance artists before were the kind of fuel that inspired Galileo to go on his own, his own way. Oh, OK. Do you guys know this piece? Is it, yeah? Yeah, it's Capoletti. Um, I've seen it in real life. Um, it, uh, Ayn Rand uh, bought this work. It was in her collection. Okay, moving humanity forward, 530, 520 BC. 
Um, Salon, uh, Salon was one of the uh, guys who came up with the idea of democracy, uh, a little older than this, but around that time. And my point is that this nude, these nudes were around of people who were thinking about democracy for the first time. Um, this, uh, this sculpture is a Roman copy, and the, the original was bronze. But when Greece became a democracy in 500 BC, they commissioned this work in honor of that. And these, these guys um, assassinated a, a, the tyrant that was uh, right before them. Um, it, these sculptures are Roman copies in marble of bronze originals. These are bronze originals. Uh, uh, from, from a little bit after, but that gives you an idea of the quality. These are real Greek sculptures. The artist did it. It's not a copy. Oh, and I'm pulling back the, the canon again. And um, this is about the same time as the works of Aristophanes. Lea Strada, the comedian, um, the clouds, the, the, the satire on uh, Socrates and stuff like that. Um, now, Ar Aristophanes, uh, in uh, one of his plays, has one of the lead actors speaking for him. And in it, he is saying that you got to, you got to vote for this guy. You got to vote for our poet because he's great. He's inventive. He never repeats himself. He doesn't use the same old jokes. He always comes up with new stuff. So he was very boisterous about saying, I'm really great at what I'm doing. <laughs> and, and Aristophanes also took to task uh, Cleon. Uh, when Aristophanes was 22, he did a poet that was a scathing attack on the head of the Athenian state who involved them in the war with Sparta. And he did a, he did a play where he just ridiculed everything about this man. Uh, the man had been a tanner, and he just, just, used, just had a field day with the man. And um, Cleon uh, uh, sued him for libel. So here you have the most powerful man in Athens suing a 22-year-old for libel. And Aristophanes won the court case. So it tells you how the democracy in Athens wasn't, I mean, in some ways we hear about Socrates, but in another way we hear, it's amazing that, that the court of law worked. Um, this is a, another copy um, from, from a Venus. Uh, it's called the Medici Venus. Uh, the Medicis had it during the, during the Renaissance uh, period. And this is uh, Botticelli's Venus. And Botticelli, copied her body. Can you see the connection there? He added the hair. He made a little change with the hands. Uh, but essentially, he got to use the, the Greek sculpture as a prototype for his work. And then him going back, using a Greek pro prototype to make a magnificent um, uh, Venus. Now. What that was telling you is that during the Renaissance, they were really uh, using a lot of uh, uh, influences from, from ancient Greece. Um, and so I did a little research. Uh, there's a book called pa uh, Padua and the Tudors, English Students, 1485 to 1603, and how all the English students learned about medicine and science from, from the, the scholars in Padua. Um, and took that back to England with them. There's um, the uh, translation of Aristotle in uh, 1495 by a guy called uh, Manu Manutuus. Um, and uh, they were afraid of, about the invasion of the Greek, uh, about the Turkish armies coming uh, into Europe. And they were fearing that they were going to destroy all the classical works. So they created a printing house to uh, print up Aristotle's work. And there's a guy called uh, Ficiano, uh, 1433 to 1499. Um, he uh, was the, considered the most influential representative of uh, Renaissance pl Platonicism. Uh, um, and uh, he made the first complete translation of the Platonic corpus into the Western language in 1484. So you can see how with the Botticelli, 
they were influenced by the ancient Greece in the sculpture and then using it to make new work. And here other people were using the ancient Greeks and bringing it into their scholarship. Um, the famous Sistine Chapel, the creation of Adam, 14, uh, 1508, Michelangelo. Um, one of the good friends of Michelangelo was Vasari. And he was a painter, an architect, uh, and he was the first art historian. And he is the prototype for great art history. So he was a good friend of Michelangelo, saw all this stuff going on, and then became inspired to create an innovative new uh, science, the art history. Um, this is, again, another uh, Boucher, uh, 1752. It's a very erotic piece. Um, another Boucher, uh, The Birth of Venus, 1750. And this is Madame Pompidou by Boucher. Now, Madame Pompidou was a very influential person, and she uh, was a good friend of uh, Voltaire. And they corresponded a lot, and they interacted. And she was also uh, discreetly endorsed Diderot's Encyclopedia. And that encyclopedia had a lot to do with the separation of church and state. It was anti-religious. And so I'm showing you that in her orbit of people, she had artists doing nudes, and she had these scholars cutting uh, innovative new ideas about society, philosophy, um, and politics. And um, Derrida, a quote from him, is that all things must be examined, debated, investigated, without exception, and without regard for anyone's feelings. Does it sound like Rand? So we're, so, there is this uh, nice connection there. 1863, Manet's Olympia. Bizet's Carmen was 1875. She's an independent woman, uh, sexual, out there. Carmen is wild, sexual, out there, and independent. Uh, Victor Hugo wrote just before Manet's Olympia, La Miserable. And in 1966, Victor Hugo wrote a four-act play called The Thousand Frank Reward. And he did a series of plays, and they were entitled Art and Liberty. And they remained unpublished in his lifetime. They really didn't come around till much, much, much later. But the connection of the visual of an independent woman who had her own life uh, playing off of the, the artist playing off of Victor Hugo and then feeding it back to him again. The American Revolution. Uh, Copley. He painted this one. It's a really crude painting. He painted it when he was 15 years old. An American painting this before America was a country, painting a nude like this? I was shocked. I thought they were all Puritans. I, I, was, I was really surprised finding this. Um, he uh, went on. Uh, to uh, paint this famous painting, uh, Watson and the Shark. Um, it, and and Compley was kind of, it's kind of difficult. His father-in-law was the poor guy that had consigned the tea for the Boston, tea, that ended up in the sea from the Boston Tea Party. So his family that he married into were loyalists. So he was kind of caught between the Americans, which he sympathized with, his family, and then being a painter. Now, if you look at this painting, we've got this naked guy in the water. That has to be Copley. It's, and we got this big shark. And we don't know who that is, whether it's the Loyalist or the Americans. And we got the people saving him. And so it's an interesting trio of dynamic going on there that can be uh, thought about uh, in a fascinating way. Now, uh, Copley uh, painted. Um, Mercy Otis Warren, and uh, she is one of. She was the first American writer and playwright, and she wrote the history of the rise, progress, and termination of the American Revolution in three volumes in 1805. So he painted her direct. This is a painting he did of her. 
So Copley did nudes, but he also was in contact with this woman. This is Paul Revere. He painted Paul Revere. Uh, Samuel Adams, he painted him. And this is uh, Margaret Kimball Cage, Gage. And she is an American spy for us. She was married to the head of the British military in the, in the, in the, before the revolution. And she was giving secrets away <laughs> to help defeat the British. And here's Copley painting her. So it's a very uh, circular, very interesting group of people there. Um, this is another Venus, uh, uh, Rossetti. Um, now his brother, uh, they're, they're in England. His brother was a, was a poet and a writer, and he wrote this. So he's influenced by his brother. It's all connected. He said, it's kind of a manifesto. He thought it was important that for the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood, the, the artists and the poets, to, to have genuine ideas, to be innovators, to study nature, um, and to sympathize with what is direct and serious and heartfelt. Study nature, be passionate, and have something unique to say. So, and this is a nude. A famous uh, Aikens painting, The Swimming Hole. Aikens did the nude, and he also did this uh, portrait of Walt Whitman. And I don't know anything about Walt Whit Whitman, but um, uh, it connected me to Emerson. And Emerson uh, talked about Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, the, the, uh, the uh, lifetime work of Walt Whitman, as being the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom America has yet contributed. And then Emerson had a mantra of his own, make the most of yourself, for that is all there is of you. And then when he was asked to sum up his, his body of work, Emerson, so it's Walt Whit Whitman, Aikens, and Emerson. Uh, he said what was central to his doctor doctrine was the infantude of the private man. And then what was interesting is that the poems of Walt Whitman were then published by Rossetti's brother. So it's all coming around again. Oh, no. OK. I couldn't resist this. This is really a, a digression. I did a little research coming to Portland, and the Portland Library worked with the main college of art in Portland. And the library gave their books to postmodern artists to make new art. So, so um, now the librarian, Mr. Whitaker, has said, it's like a magical recycling program. They turn trash into art. He's calling the leaves of, uh, the leaves of grass trash. And then um, the idea came to the librarian. The idea came to him after reading a biography of British playwright Joe Orton. Orton and his boyfriend would borrow books from the London Library, insert sexual innuendos and collages into them, into the pages, and then return them to the library to, re, to, re, to circulate them. Mr. Whitaker goes on, it was an act of vandalism, but I liked it as an act of art. So I couldn't resist put, putting this in there. Um, now, when I was uh, leading into some of, I've gotten some criticism for some of my articles from, from some people. And one, one I did a heroic, I did an article about a heroic nude sculpture, and an objectivist was saying to me, well, the Nazis did heroic nudes. And this is some, some work from the time period of Nazi Germany, of this beautiful female nude, um, heroic male nudes. Um, it's a little small, these were the biggest images I could find. Um, it's quite beautiful scene of three women um, together. I think that's a lovely piece. And some more rock nudes. And uh, I just wanted to kind of say that I don't think the Nazis had the idea right. You don't want to send out nudes 
that are expressing individuality and someone's own creativity and self-esteem when you want to be a dictator. And in comparison to some other cultures, the Nazis didn't live nearly as long as like ancient Egyptians or the American uh, government. And so they were actually sending a mixed message. So the guy who was criticizing me wanted to say because they appropriated heroic nudes, heroic nudes are bad and evil. So I'm like saying, no, 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 that was a mistake. They shouldn't have, you know, we'll let them have their own agenda, but that was a kind of mistake. Um, cultural conflict spelled out at the last judgment of Michelangelo. Um, uh, after, after Michelangelo's death, these were, uh, they were all nudes. They were all nudes. There were no covering, no nothing, because Michelangelo believed you came into the world naked, you go out naked, that's it. Um, but when he died, but, but when he died, the, the, the church was going to destroy the, the, the Last Judgment. And someone finally said, no, we'll, we'll do some little covering, so we'll cover up the nudity. Now, um, idealized human nude images provokes cultural conflict with Christian, Jewish, and Muslim religions. Um, quote, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. I am a jealous God, unquote. Uh, Exodus, uh, um, um, oh, that, that's from Exodus. Um, quote, a Muslim artist is constrained by the general prohibition preventing any figural treatment of the divine or human countenance, for God only can create. And it's, it's my belief that the heroic nude represents our love of being healthy, of being whole, of being integrated, being passionate, and being integrated and independent. It strengthens our self-esteem and it inspires us to be our best. And that is what those religious people don't want individuals to have. That's why they don't want godlike images or nudes to, to be created. They want to outlaw it so that we cannot experience our spiritual best. Um, where we are, sorry, where we are today, this is a Lucian Freud, 1991. Um, he's, a, he's a super famous, famous artist. This work of his sold last month for $35 million. Sotheby's. And, and, and there, is a, there, is a, there is a part of postmodernism that are painters who go out of their way to create ugliness, depressing, horrific, unhealthy, the absolute opposite of a healthy vital nude. So that you have these people going. And they're getting a lot of, um, they're getting a lot of great exposure right now. So this is kind of where we're at in the, in the popular uh, art world. But $35 million is pretty significant. Um, this is uh, Schipperheim Asleep, 1987. It's absolutely gorgeous female sculpture. Um, he's a contemporary. He's working. He's about 50 years old. He's, um, I think uh, my review of him was the first review he's had. He's been an artist for 30 years. Uh, but he's there, and he's functioning, and he's doing, he's got a great studio, and he's working away in Australia. Um, uh, this is uh, Jacob Collins, Candace. It's a beautiful female nude. It's uh, a couple of years old. He lives in New York. He's creating a, a school, a traditional school for uh, classical uh, painting um, and doing stuff. And he's starting to develop his career, but his paintings don't sell for $35 million. <laughs> They're not anywhere close. Um, this is a, a Stuart Feldman piece, one of my favorite uh, sculptors, Sun Worshipper. Uh, this is from probably the 80s as well. And this is uh, Schipperheim's her heroic nude. It's 14 feet bronze. And um, uh, Madame, uh, Madame, Madame Murdoch, Lady Murdoch, 
Lady Murdoch, uh, commissioned uh, this piece of, of Peter, so she paid for it being built. Then she donated it to a sculpture garden in Australia. And it's on a little tiny island uh, in the sculpture garden. So you, you, there's water between you and it. And the, um, the curators of the uh, sculpture garden um, are really unhappy with it. And they've been covering it up with a forest of eucalyptus trees. So you cannot see it. So they are a little bit postmodern. It's a, it's a beautiful male sculpture. It's, it's heroic. It's in great proportions. Uh, Peter Schipperheim is a, is a great, uh, happy, passionate guy who works hard. Um, and, and he's there. So that's, um, that's where we're at. Um, now, Ed, Ed, point, uh, Ed Hutchins pointed out yesterday that there's a lot of positive things going on in, the, in, in, in ideas going on today. And the same thing is true happening in the arts. We just have to look for it. Thank you very much. I've just always wondered about the Medici Venus. It just looks very awkward. What is it doing? And what do you think of its posture, her posture? It's a copy. So if we'd seen the original, you might not have had that feeling at all. You would have just gone, wow. But, but it might have been from a, a, an artist who just wasn't so good. And so he um, couldn't copy it well. So. I have a quick one. Um, if I understand your thesis correctly, um, you're not saying that uh, um, painting and sculptor, uh, sculpture, which um, embodies clothed figures, necessarily does, uh, cannot or does not um, uh, demonstrate any kind of individuality of traits, but you're saying that nudes uh, almost exclusively do. Is, would that be accurate? That's perfect. Perfect summation. Yeah. The, the, as I showed you, there were some painters who did both. They do clothes and nudes. But I wanted to show that they did nudes, and that, that was uh, uh, exclusively through the body and the expression. Yeah. Uh, Michael, interesting talk, um, very much you. Uh, uh, Kenneth Clark said in his book, uh, on The Nude, he talked about the erotic element. He said that whenever you present a nude, there's always an erotic element. And as I recall his argument, then the sculpture goes on to transcend that in some way to make some other statement. But any comments about the erotic aspect of, of the nude? Well, that's a sense of, uh, I mean, Peter Schipperheim talked to me a little bit about that, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a sense of freedom. It's a sense of like, well, we're all sexual beings, so if you have a sexual feeling, it's not the end of the world, and it's not worth repressing. So um, it's a, a part of it, but then when you're accustomed to it, it's no big deal. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's just, it's like when people flirt. That's a sexual innuendo and they flirt, but it doesn't mean that there's anything bad about it. And that's in, in, in the nude has the same kind of feeling. Right. Well, I was thinking maybe tying it back in with the fact that you said that this sculpture was now surrounded with eucalyptus trees. And that's because they don't want the individual heroic nude to exist. They don't want us to be happy. <laughs> that's the reason why they're covering it up. It has nothing to do with the sexuality of it. But you it, don't think that was even a even a, not even remotely. I know that it's. I'm certain. No, about no, it. I don't mean. In, I don't mean in the sense of puritanism, but more the general denial of the body well, uh, it, philosophy. The postmodernists are very, very grumpy people, <laughs> and 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 they just can't stand it. They just can't stand to see a happy, benevolent, independent person. They want to make you codependent and miserable. And so when they see a sculpture that's obviously, uh, for them, has out of it, and they may not know all the reasons why, and that's what I want to point out, is that those are the reasons behind the nude that are there, and that's what they can't stand. It has nothing to do with sex. So, so Michael, thank you very much for uh, quite an interesting talk. Thank you. And uh, the part I hadn't thought about uh, before it all was the heroic nude is not just a symbol of uh, individualism, but also innovation. So that was kind of a uh, something new for me. 
And as you were giving the talk, and it's kind of a follow-up from uh, Robert here, I was thinking about it as kind of a scale. At first it was like the clothed figure going to the nude figure. And then I started thinking about, wait a minute, there's two other places, maybe a scale is, is not the right way of thinking about this, but there's the postmodernists that now take the heroic nude and then just destroy it for $35 million. And then we have the other extreme case, which is the Islamic world, where you can't even have the clothed figure. So it is total repression artistically. Mm -hmm. And it's quite, you know, those four cases are really quite, uh, you know, an interesting uh, group to think about. Do you have but, any comments? Well, I, I didn't deal with it a lot, but I, I, I've been really lucky. I grew up on a beach as an atheist in California. <laughs> so the, the whole religious thing doesn't affect me at all. I don't have any connection with it at all. Um, but I do see that uh, those religions wouldn't allow for me to exist as a painter. They wouldn't support me. They wouldn't allow it. They would, if, if they could, if it was state, they would uh, throw me in jail. So, so it's, it's interesting that I don't have that, but it's like they have a problem with it. So, so. my other quip would be for your friend who uh, you were having the argument with about heroic nudes in the, the Nazi period, you can now turn it around and say, well, see, the heroic nudes defeated them or something. What? That's, I, was, I was hinting at that, isn't it? No, I think, uh, I think that the Nazis would have been better off with the Egyptian sculptures, you know, or something like that, kind of modern Egyptian type well, of... Well, that uh, was sort of an Egyptian there, type sculpture. There, there you go, yeah. Hey, I had a... a I'm sorry. I had a, um, a little confused about the history. You brought the Michelangelo painting showing how it was covered up after he died. Yet there's David, you know, fully nude, and I'm assuming prominently displayed, you know, during his lifetime. Uh, what was, you know, was there a contradiction in the church and in Italy, or you know, was it simply not public for certain areas, or how how did that work? It, they had a whole history of of, of being influenced by the humanists, by Greek uh, pagan stuff, and being uh, the the church. So I don't know enough about the history, but Thomas Aquinas was trying to pull things together. And so it was like a mixed economy. They weren't sure. And the Sistine Chapel was in Rome at the Vatican, and the David was in Florence at the Academy. So it wasn't uh, in the same place. Thank you, Michael. And I don't have a, qu a question. I just had a realization from your survey here that since ancient Rome um, and, and to, till today, because the culture, the, the, the common culture, regards nude as something shameful and, and was prohibited or not acceptable, it seems like there was al almost a natural selection that the artists that chose to paint nude had to be um, an individualist, uh, courageous, very confident in his own view of human uh, nature and, and the body is a beautiful thing because they had to go against the whole culture to do, to do this work and, and sometimes risk their, li their life to do that. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's just an interesting But that's, thing. <laughs> that's the innovator part and in how people can react negatively to it. And, and the nude was part of that, that freedom and the spirit and the Corbet saying why I'm, I'm from a free regime. I want to be free for the rest of my life. Um, so I think it, that's why also it comes out in these nudes, the, the, the heroic, because the artist's heroic well, uh, there may, there, out. There may be one other element, is that it may just be a really natural phenomenon. When you have nudes, you bring out those qualities in humanity. It, that would, it wouldn't matter whether it was in ancient Greece where everyone accepted it, or in a society where it didn't, it would speak to that type of core being. So. I'm not happy being a contrarian twice in a row, but... Um, Go for it. Uh, the paintings from the uh, Renaissance or maybe late Middle Ages where everyone's going to hell and getting eaten by monsters, there's a lot of nudes there, and I've always gotten the sense that having all these people be naked made them all kind of, kind of a herd, you know, as part of depicting them as puny and... Yeah, vulnerable. 
going on? Well, there were some newts also in ancient Greece, I mean in ancient Egypt, and they were slaves. But it was very clearly illustrated that they were slaves. And then uh, what you're talking about is having the people going to hell in the Middle Ages and, and, and then being tortured in hell and stuff. They may have been sending a message to all the independent people out there. <laughs> <laughs> that if you're independent and you like the nude, you're going to you're going to burn. But the context was more in contrast to the ancient Greeks, where it's just a nude, right. a godlike nude. There isn't anything else. So in both cases, the the nudity emphasized that they're an individual, but in the religious painting, it's like That's look bad. what you are as an individual. Yeah. Yes. No? Yes. Sure. Um, I'm probably rather dense, but I I had not. Um, thought of the connection between um, nudes and individualism. Well, that I had made the connection, but between that and sabotaging the state. So um, thank you for making that point. And, and it made me think of obscenity laws and uh, free speech and some of the controversies. And I was reminded of um, a, uh, a club owner who uh, they were trying to shut him down. And so he had his um, dancers um, pose and he had artists come in and paint them. Um, and um, and then he had uh, and then he also had his dancers on the stage reading Shakespeare as they were taking off their clothes and he argued freedom of <laughs> speech and expression, and I thought that was an interesting case because he directly brought to the forefront the conflict of um, when is it art and when is it um, not art and, and uh, so called obscenity is it even possible to draw the line um, and if you could draw the line where would you draw it. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thought was um, how would, uh, you know, has, has it been explicitly this, you know, obscenity law, has it been explicitly the state trying to squash individualism um, or has it been more um, just people don't want other people to have any fun or maybe a combination of both and, um, you know, have you followed the, uh, you know, the, the history of that? Well, you're taking me a little far afield because in an art, I'm kind of in a safe haven in a way um, because it's not dealing with like real, real time naked people. Now, Pink Snow might have some interesting <laughs> ideas about this. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, she has her band Erotic, Re Erotica, um, and she's um, on that uh, border all the time on doing that. But I, I, I like to stay in the same thing. It's, it's a painting. It's just paint. <laughs> They're not really doing this. It's just paint. <laughs> so. um, I, I guess as a follow-up, in the history of some of these, we're the, it, when we look at it today, contemporarily, we think art, beauty, it's heroic, it's individualism. At the time, did people take any of these pieces differently? Or did they think of it as, oh, that's erotic, that's naughty? Um, or were they, you know, were they still in the same heroic, uh, do they have the same kind of perspective that, that we have looking back at it? No, they had a different perspective. They don't have what we actually have. Uh, when, uh, when Michelangelo did the David, he was um, uh, bombarded with um, these uh, notes of admiration. There were thousands of notes saying, this is magnificent, thank you so much, this is just incredible. So pretty universally, they just saw the beauty in it and, and, uh, and loved it. What's weird in America is they don't always feel that way. So um, they, I don't know what it, what's causing that, why they don't embrace the nude. Could you talk, do you know anything about nudes in Soviet Russia or in, in behind the Iron Curtain? I, all the socialist realist paintings I can think of are, I don't remember even any nudes being used as metaphoric creatures. But they're probably a little wiser than the Nazis. Yeah. But, but uh, um, they did, that's one element that I didn't mention was that the nudes, that the cloth figures are also used as for propaganda. So it, it can be used, not for fine art, but to, um, to send a message to the populace that this is the way it is. Um, so. uh, following on that a question, the, would you say that the Nazis were trying to, in a sense, in, in, in the heroic nude uh, that they were uh, displaying, and you had some uh, wonderful examples, that they were trying to appropriate or act as parasites on the individualist emotion, the passion and so forth, and then translate that to the state? In other words, just um, uh, 
swipe the feelings and so forth and, and to attach them to the state. And of course, it, it was a contradiction that didn't, uh, didn't work out very well for them. Right. I have uh, some uh, Dutch friends that cannot listen to Beethoven's Ninth for that very reason, because they're haunted by the um, uh, Nazi propaganda movies that used, used uh, uh, Beethoven's Ninth. And uh, so when they hear it, they associate that with Nazism. And so that's, that's, that's another crime that's, that's horrible, to, to, to take that kind of music about freedom and gloriousness and associate to uh, their agenda. Thank you so much, Michael. Very, very much.